Hi, folks. This is Rick Doc Walker, the DOC. This is John Kime, and you're listening to The Mess Hall with Rally Captain and Tailgate Ted. What's going on, Rally? Welcome back from the West Coast, man. Hey, man. They say the left coast is the best coast, but I'm here to tell you, it feels good being back on the East Coast, brother. Let's get it. Out there with you, man. I went out to Seattle earlier this year for a wedding, and not to knock the place because I don't want to piss anybody off, but I don't know. East Coast is home for me, and if it comes down to East Coast versus West Coast rap, I'm definitely an East Coast guy. So glad to have you back, though, dude. I know that uh, some of our listeners have been wondering what's going on. Rally is just dialing into the show today. You got no video from him, but if you're checking out the YouTube, eh, you can still see me on here. And we'll still have clips and some different stuff from the actual game. But, man, dude, your trip looked like a blast other than Sunday. I mean, I'm oh. I'm sitting here checking your Instagram feed and everything else. I mean, you stopped at so many spots. Break it down for our listeners. I didn't get a chance to make it out there. Well, um, so we stayed at the Embassy Suites in uh, Pioneer Square, which was like a block from the stadium, if even a block. Uh, walked out of the hotel, take a left, and the stadium's right there. Boom. Um, but Friday, got in, chopped it up with a bunch of people who were staying at the hotel who said they listened to the DMV mess hall, and we greatly appreciate it. Shout out goes to Omar. Omar stopped me and said, man, I'm one of your biggest fans, and I listened to you and Ted on the DMV mess hall. So I said, Omar, I'm going to remember your name and give you a shout. So so big shout out to you. And um, man... Seattle, the people are very welcoming. I mean, they, they aren't like any other city that I've been to. Uh, everybody was just nice and kind and, and just helpful on every level. And um, no, I don't even think anybody even booed me, man. That's a, that's that's a weird thing. Most stadiums, you know, somebody at least boos you. But nobody even booed me. They were like, hey, good game. You know, hope you have a good game. And I was just like, huh, interesting. But um, so we went to the Space Needle. And once again, everyone was happy. And, and I, you know me, I rock my my commander's gear or Redskins gear because I was rocking the, my old R, the, the logo R with the uh, hat and vest combo. And people were just digging on it. And um, they were like, man, we really do appreciate seeing, I'll say Redskins fans, because that's what a lot of them still want to say Redskins. So I'll, I'll say it. Uh, we really appreciate seeing so many of you guys out here because we had a huge fan presence out there. I mean, walking the streets, you couldn't go a block without seeing somebody with some type of commanders, Washington football team or Redskins gear on. That's um, awesome, man. Oh, oh yeah, man. It, it was, it was great. And then the mere fact that people knew who I was, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know that I have a presence, but I'm, I don't feel that I'm a celebrity or anything like that. It's just amazing to people say, Rally Captain, how you doing, man? And I'm just like, wow, I, I just didn't know that that many people knew me in that light. I, I I just had no no clue that they would that they knew me. Um, so that was Friday. Uh, then we went to the uh, so Saturday we got up and decided to do a little more tourism stuff. Went uh, the Space Needle, and after the Space Needle, decided to get a bite to eat. Walking down the street, who do I see? Byron Pringle. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, and I actually did a little video with him. And um, if you guys haven't seen it, and uh, he's a real cool dude. And 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 basically, man, he says, basically, man, I got a friend for life. And it was just good chopping him up. And he goes, anytime I see you, I'm going to come say hello to you. And there's a picture of me on the sideline with him. And he kept his word. He did that. I was actually shocked that he did. Because a lot of times, you know, Guys, it's game day. They got a lot of stuff on their mind. You know, you, you, you're focused on the game, not necessarily fans, if you will. And the mere fact that he stopped by and 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 took a, a short picture with me, I mean, he, he literally meant what he said. Hey, man, I, I'm a friend for life now. You know, and that, and that meant a lot to me. Did he recognize you from other games, just being in, you know, where you typically are? Or, yes. you know, how was he, it on the street? He, he says... uh he says, oh, you that guy that B-Rob jumped into the arms uh, <laughs> last <laughs> week. And I was like, yeah, man. He goes, he goes, it's good meeting you, man. I've seen you, but, you know, they just, uh, I think more players 
you know, they, they see me, but until there's like an off field experience where they can really yeah, chop like it up with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, other than that, I mean, they're, they're, like I said, they're folks on the game, man. They're not trying to, to, to be friends with anybody, so to speak, you know, but it was just good that, uh, he was able to keep his word. And, and, and he said, no matter what, I will always come by and say hello to you. You got a friend for life. Just very, very, uh, Good feeling then saturday awesome. night yeah saturday night was a rally and i gotta tell you man the rally was a lot better uh than than the previous rallies um they they, they stepped their game up a little bit i mean they got some more improvement to go but for the most part it was a good rally and and i gotta tell you man my hand got tired for signing autographs i've never signed that many autographs in my life but saturday night was the night to get it done and so it was it was amazing. That's great to hear, man. How many fans do you estimate were there at the rally? Ooh, uh, maybe one fifty to two hundred, possibly. Okay. And, and, it, and it could be it could be more two fifty. I mean, possibly more. Um, but there was a very great good crowd. Uh, I'm, I was very happy, and uh, I, I told Macy, I said, "Hey, you know you." you you're improving it <laughs> and she goes well, that's good to hear and so uh we talked a couple minutes more about some other things but other than that man it was, it was great came back home not home but back to the hotel rather uh because it was a long day man and, you know that getting getting used to that time zone just it just it kills you bro oh yeah it, it, it really does and so uh woke up at three uh pacific northwest time which was six you know, back home, and it's like, okay, now what do I do? But uh, luckily, the Embassy Suites has a great made-to-order breakfast program, so I was able to get that taken care of and get a good breakfast before the game. And and man, it was game day. And like you said, the outcome didn't didn't fare how we liked for it to. But at the same time, man, it was a good game. And and EB said it best. And speaking of which, of EB, I met his mom on the sidelines. I didn't post a oh, picture awesome. of her. Yeah, I didn't post a picture of her, but I met her, met, met his mom, and she was a nice, nice lady. And uh, we chopped it up for a minute. And um, something that he said, it, it resonates with me. And I think that I will always can use this saying that he said, we did enough to entertain some people, but we didn't win. And that that stuck with me. And anytime we lose in that fashion, I'm going to say that. I mean, it, it definitely was an entertaining game. And, you know, you picked them to win this past week on our preview pod. And, you know, I picked them to lose just because I, I didn't know if we'd be able to hang with their wide receivers. And we gave up almost 500 yards of offense. Regardless of how you think about the past four hours of it, it was entertaining. And we're going back and forth on that game. And I'm sure in those stands, we shocked their fans. I mean, I'm sure those 12s were, you know, just kind of, you know, creaking in their boots, if you will, once B-Rob got that first touchdown and we got that opening drive TD and Sam, like, escaped that blitz and just hit him out in that flat and next thing you know, B's gone. So, I mean, it, there were definitely some back and forth in that game that was great to see and the future's bright for the offense. It's just that defense, man, not so entertaining, at least from my standpoint. No, man, I feel like uh, Smokey from Friday – we ain't never got two things to go together. Ham, no burger. Offense, no defense. Bam! <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I feel, man. And I don't know what is going on with these guys, man. Um, th th well, I will say Percy Butler, he he whiffed on a tackle. Two tackles he whiffed on. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I I was just like, yo, what the what's the deal? Um, that kind of upset me. And you know me, man. I, I don't really get upset too much i mean I, I these games to me and i try to convey this to everybody else we've been through so many losing seasons to where this shouldn't be something new to you yeah it, it stings because it was such a close game but at the same time going home and wanting to smash your tv or whatever have you we, we've been here before you know just you, you deal with it and i roll with the punches and i think that everybody else should be able to do that as well although i know that Everyone else doesn't feel the way that I feel. But uh, it comes down to Ted, man. You know, I, I, once again, I never want to see anybody get fired. But I feel as though JDR has lost the locker room. I, I, I really do. I, agree. I, 
Yeah, I, I, I feel I feel as though um, I'm not going to say they don't want to play for him, but something just isn't there. We aren't getting the same motivation that we had last year. Something is missing. I mean, and there's I, there's a lot missing. And I, I think part of that is last year it was different competition we were going up against. It was different caliber of teams we were going up against. But regardless, right now, we're sucking versus bad teams. And I'm not saying that the Seahawks are a bad team. We talked about it before. They're an average team. Mm -hmm. We held them to 4-14 four and 14 on third down, right? 4-14 for 14 on third down, but they still put up 489 yards of offense. That shouldn't be possible. But we gave up a bunch of explosive plays. There was that 64-yard run yeah. by that one kid. I mean, it was just – it was ridiculous. And the big plays have always been an issue here. But how many times are we going to see David Mayo covering a wide receiver and a guy going across his body? I mean, the guy can't cover anyone, especially Tyler Lockett, going out in the flat. And it was just frustrating. You would think Del Rio would scheme accordingly – but I feel that he's just too stubborn and doesn't want to make any changes. And nothing has changed. Our defense right now is still atrocious. If your offense puts up 26 points, you should win that game. Sure. If your offense ties the game up with, and I'm going back and looking at my notes, with 52 seconds left, you should hopefully play for overtime at that point and we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves but the defense didn't do us any favors but sam i can't believe it man he had another 300 pass 300 yard passing game i mean yeah he, he is leading the nfl in passing yards right now if i would have told you that in week 11 going into sam would lead the league in passing what would you say our record would be if he was leading the league, you're speaking of last year. No, if, if I were to tell you at the beginning of the season, hey, Rally. Oh, the beginning of the season. Week okay. 11. Okay. And Sam Howell is going to be leading the NFL, beating all of the quarterbacks in passing yards. What do you think our record's going to be? I'd say, man, we, we would probably be uh, uh, seven and three. Yeah, I would. Oh. I'd agree with you. I, I think seven and three is a fair estimate because we were all under the belief that. Sam Howell was a gigantic question mark heading into the season. No one yeah. knew what we had with him. Yes, he beat the Cowboys, but he only threw the ball 19 times. And if you said you knew, then either you're a gigantic North Carolina fan and you watched him in college, or you're just lying. And I knew that Sam could make all the throws just based upon going to training camp and being there. But I was suspect about the enemy, mm -hmm. first time play caller coming in, and this offensive line. Well, the offensive line was horrible this past Sunday. I mean, I'm looking at the pro football focus grades, looking here at pass blocking, and from a pass block perspective, taking a look at this, Sam Cosme got a 27.7, right? That's your right guard. Tyler Larson, your center, got a 17.2 in pass blocking, right? Chris Paul, a 6.9 in pass blocking in true passing sets. A 6.9, but yet Sam still put up over 300 yards. And it's because Sam is now finally feeling that pressure and understanding where it's coming from. There were a couple of times, and like we said at the beginning of the show, that first pass to B-Rob when he had that touchdown, Sam got blitzed off his, I think it was his right side. The right he side. The ball, and then ran left towards the flat and saw B-Rob running down it and hit him no problem. So, I mean, Sam's feeling that pressure and he's able to make adjustments and he's not using his legs a ton, except there was that one play where, I mean, I'm just sitting here having flashbacks of Chris Cooley fighting for a first down. And you know which one I'm talking about. Sam's running around. Mm -hmm. It was a zone read. He kept the ball for a change, which he very rarely does, but he got the first down. He had a chance to slide. He just didn't do it. And he got that fumble and you just you hate to see that because it was a nice 15 yard run, but then Sam coughed the ball up and he said it himself. The defenders were holding him up and they weren't letting him go down. And you would have hoped that the refs would blow the whistle, but he wasn't being held up for that long a time where he was impeded. It's just you, 
these are some of the growing pains with a young quarterback. You think, you know, watching Russell Wilson last night on the Monday night game, he gets that first down, he slides, he goes down. He's not taking the unnecessary hits. And Sam yeah. was trying to fight for it. And it reminded me of the week prior on that third and 23 where he's fighting for those extra yards and it was great. And he needed every single bit of that fight, but he got the first down by three or four yards thinking, man, go down, go down. What are you doing? And next thing you know that he just coughs that ball up. Well, I also think Ted, that, it, that it seemed as though he surprised himself in getting it. And then once he got it, maybe he thought that the whistle was going to blow as well until it didn't. And then the ball gets ripped out. But I agree with you. Hey man, um, get what you can and, and, and just go down slide. That is don't go, hit four like Heineke did and and <laughs> lost the Green Bay game. Well, I'm going to say he lost the Green Bay game for us, but but uh, that was a contributing factor back in, in 2022. But, um, yeah, you know, I tell you, the only the only bad thing that uh, that I, that didn't happen with me Sunday was I didn't call for B-Rob to be the first scorer, but I did call him to be a anytime touchdown scorer. So imagine oh, yeah. if I would have Imagine if I would have picked him to be the score for the first touchdown out of one double my money, but I didn't do that, but I did win money on him scoring an anytime touchdown. So right out the gate, I was happy about that. And you know, man, Seattle has a weird, they don't have gaming out there. They have casinos. So they make you go into the casino. You can't, oh, you can't place win. your bets. You can't place. Yeah. Time. No, you can't place your bets. ahead gotcha. of time. Yeah. Where's the casino and, out there? Well, apparently there was a couple of them. I don't know. But but what I had to do was I had to call back and have a buddy of mine put the bet in for me because when I left, they didn't have any time touchdown score props up yet. So that was gotcha. really jacked up. Yeah. Yeah, because so. what I typically do is when I'm at the airport, because I live in D.C., so I can't put the bets in when I'm sitting in D.C., so I'll typically do it at the airport. And when I put my bet in on, I want to say it was Wednesday or Thursday, I was still trying to get it at six and a half points spread-wise. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have any anytime prop bets for players yet. So that right. kind of frustrated me, but I was able to get the uh, point spread. So I took the uh, commanders plus the points thinking that they would cover, which was great. But I also had a nice little parlay in and I just missed it because B-Rob didn't get too many rushing yards after oh. the fact. But yeah, it looks like there's a bunch of casinos far off, not too close to the actual uh, airport or stadium or anything else out there. So. Oh, well, I mean, we might have to get a betting sponsor, maybe talk to Toothpick and see how we can hook us up with one of those guys. But the offense, the only thing that frustrated me was the lack of running production, rushing production. And I understand Seattle definitely clamped down on the guys rushing. But it was a little frustrating to see, like, the first 21 plays that we called offensively, 17 of them were throws. And we talk about the enemy script and was he just sticking to that script or was this the game plan the entire time? Or was there an issue with us not being able to really get anywhere on the ground and the enemy calling those run players? Well, this is what Rivera had to say about it. Your running backs had big game yeah. as receivers. The, the run pass balance was a bit out of whack. Again, was that just sort of just the way the game evolved or do you guys just think it was better to attack them through the air? Well, I think it evolved a little bit that way, but, um, you know, we were having success attacking them through the air. And, um, you know, again, as I said, later in, later on in the game, we found a couple of things that we liked and we stuck to it and it put us right back in the game. So we had 14 carries on offense. Two of those were Sam. One, I want to say, was a scramble that I wouldn't really count as a design run. So we really weren't getting anywhere on the ground. And from a run blocking perspective, Sam Cosme, they gave him a 74. Uh, let's see here. We've got Leno got a 54. Larson got a 47. Wiley got a 42. And Chris Paul got a 37. So, I mean, our run blocking was atrocious at that point. They really didn't get a chance to get anywhere. And I'm kind of shocked considering how well we did against the Eagles running the ball and a couple of the other teams in the past. And Seattle isn't known for their run defense compared to some of the other teams that we played. But it was good to see them get the guys involved in the passing game. 
but I was a little surprised that we did so poor on the ground. I mean, were you seeing something out there in person? Because I haven't had a chance to look at the All-22 versus uh, what we saw on TV back home. Um, I Same. I, I really haven't had time to, to look at anything. Um, but it did shock me, and I was telling people next to me, I said, man, I'm really surprised that we have not gone back to the run. And it's almost like we gave up on them running the ball. But then the second half, we were making some headway running the ball. So it's just, it's just really weird. And I, I get it. EB, he throws to open the run versus most people run to throw, open the throw. So, I mean, I, I, I get it. it. It's hard to to fathom, but that's just how it is. So um, like you, I'll have to look to see what was going on, but I really didn't see them. I really didn't see them stopping us like that. Maybe the, the guys just weren't holding their blocks or something, but it, it I, I just felt they went away from the run too, too quick. Cause we weren't yeah. down. I mean, it was, we stayed tied for the most part. I mean, and at one point in time we were even up. So it, it's just, it's just kind of, one of those things where somebody's got to walk behind him and pull his coattail and say, run the ball. Yeah. And I was actually, I was proud of the team because you really didn't see any false start penalties. You didn't see any stupid stuff from an mm -mm. offensive perspective. I mean, crowd noise. I've been to Seattle a couple of times for games, but for our listeners, I mean, can you tell them how loud it was or did we give them a reason not to cheer considering how close the game was? No, I would say that, um, when I was there in 2017, I wasn't impressed with the crowd noise. However, this trip, I was very impressed with the crowd noise. And I was going to see if Sam had said anything about uh, the crowd noise, because if I'm not mistaken, he said that Virginia Tech was the loudest stadium that he'd ever played in. So I'm wondering how he compared that with uh, this past Sunday, because they got loud. We, I mean, we shut them down, but then they got loud. And 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 I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. But here's the other thing, Ted. I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but but to a degree, we got loud and caused them to have about two false starts. Yeah, they had two false starts that I saw. And I mean, I could definitely see the Commanders fans on the TV feed. It was a beautiful sight, man. Just seeing the burgundy and gold there, regardless, Commanders, WFT or Redskins, just to see you guys out there. I saw you standing next to a couple of fans in the end zone. And Did then there you? was, yeah. I, oh yeah. You were on the feet a couple of times. I saw you standing there. There was a guy that had like a white Jersey beside you and another guy beside him. And I think some of the fans that don't know you as well might've thought that you were in the other end zone. Cause there was a guy that had a Washington commander's flag in the other end zone. That's not field level. So it's up higher up. And I think some people might have thought that that was you on your end. It's it's funny because you can't miss your flag or the chain. And I'm, obviously, I'm looking forward to every game, trying to see what's going on. But there was burgundy and gold throughout those stands, man. And it was just, it was beautiful to see. And the fact that, just like EB said, it was entertaining. You guys had something to look forward to and something to watch and something to enjoy, even though in – I'm not one to blame the refs, but there were some BS calls this game. First one being getting rid of Emmanuel Forbes on that hit. Have you had a chance to actually see the replay of it yet? No. And at the stadium, when they – so, okay, so obviously when it happened, you could tell that it was kind of a weird hit, helmet to helmet hit, okay? So you, you're like, all right, that's fine. But then – when they actually slowed it down and, you know, where you can actually dissect it, you're like, ooh, okay, maybe that wasn't good. But as far as ejecting him is concerned, I thought that was a little egregious. Um, but because I've seen worse and I haven't seen, I, I don't know the last NFL player I've seen get ejected. I've seen college players get ejected, but an NFL player, no. Now, um, the guy who sitting next to me, um, he was a season ticket holder for like 50 years. He was telling me he had the same seats for like 50 years or something to that effect. He was Elton John is who he looked like to me. Um, <laughs> he was saying that that receiver 
uh, had been hit last week in the head a couple times. And so he felt that that was his, their payback for not calling some of the calls last week for him. That's BS though, man. It's a completely different player, different play. And the last person that got ejected, I remember was that guy from the Broncos that hit Logan Thomas. Uh, was it uh, Kareem Jackson? He got ejected that game when mm -hmm. Logan held on to that ball in the end zone and don't yeah. know how the hell he did it. But I just, I think it was utter crap that they ejected Forbes. This is actually what Forbes had to say about it. This is from uh, JP Finley's Twitter talking about okay. the ejection. Well, scramble drill, seeing the ball in there, yeah. going to break it up. Yeah. And I guess, did the referee explain to you or what was your conversation like? No, they just told me I was ejected uh, from the game. Didn't know like why or anything like that. Were you pretty shocked that was an ejection? Yes, I was in shock that it was an ejection. It, was, uh, it wasn't a, like I was trying to kill him play. It was just a play I was trying to make a play on the ball. Did you look at, did you see a replay of it at all? Oh, I did once I got in the locker room. And what did you think? Did you have to You've done anything different yeah, I, That's the only way I could have hit him to try to dislodge the ball, and I don't think it was a terrible hit. So it, it's frustrating because it's a bang bang play. The other part that drives you crazy is Lockett already dropped the ball. So if you slow it down, I mean, obviously it's going to look bad, but in real time, I don't feel the manual was trying to hurt the kid. He was trying to do anything just malicious at all. He's not a headhunter. I mean, you sneeze, the kid will fall over. And Nikki Javala from the Washington Post talked to the head of officiating, Walt Anderson, on the ejection of Forbes, and this is what it was said. Question, on the Emmanuel Forbes unnecessary roughness penalty, was that called clearly for the helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit? Anderson, yes, the foul on the field was for the forcible contact on a defensive player, which was the receiver. Question, okay. And what determined the ejection? I know they said at the game here that upon further review, they decided it was grounds for ejection. Anderson, right. Yes, Rule 19 allows New York, whenever a flag is thrown for unnecessary roughness on the field, it allows us to take a further look. What we're looking to try to avoid is helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. It was certainly not a bang-bang type play where you have both the defender and the receiver just playing for the ball. We want players to stay away from the helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. We're also looking at is the defender making the attempt to play the ball or is he making no attempt to separate the ball from the player in terms of going straight to the head. And in this case, it was the latter where he just went straight to the head. And that's why it rose to the level of disqualification. Got it. Just to clarify, you said that this was done from assistance from New York and the ref said, yes. So once again, New York comes in and screws us. I just, hmm. I, I, I hate the call. I'm not saying that because I'm a Washington fan and we do a, a commander's podcast. I just don't know how many times we've seen Logan Thomas get hit up high in the head. And only one time has a guy been ejected for it. And Forbes did not mean anything by this hit. It's not like he's got yeah. a history of it. Like I'm, I'm going to the caps game later on tonight. We're playing the golden Knights. Tom Wilson has a history of hitting people and knocking the crap out of them. So he's built that brand. So if he hits somebody, sometimes the suspension comes. Forbes, the kid's a rookie. You don't have to worry about that with him. At least you shouldn't have to worry about that with him. And I feel the NFL just made an example out of him for whatever reason. I mean, I hear the guy in the stands telling you it's retaliation or a makeup for weeks prior, but I don't know, man. That's just some BS to me. Yeah. Well, I didn't – it's one of those things where you, you, you're you there and you just say, okay. I mean, I – I'm not going to argue with someone. I don't know what happened last week. I'm not a fan of Seattle. So, but obviously he was, and so he had more knowledge in his opinion. So I just went with it. Um, hate to see it for him, but I, I'm looking forward to seeing him have a bounce back week this week. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's all a learning experience. And I think that he, I'm hoping that what it doesn't do is it doesn't hinder him to the point where he's afraid to, to put his head back in there again. You know what I mean? To where, um, you know, cause it's like when, he, when, when AJ Brown burned him a couple of times, I think that he may have been a little gun shy and he needed that week off. And I'm hoping that it doesn't take that to get him back into the, to, to the grind of things. Yeah. I, I hope you're right. Cause I mean, he had a heck of a game the week prior and granted the Patriots are bad. I mean, they're, they're really bad. I, I, don't know if you, you probably didn't watch the game on Sunday because it was the early game 
out overseas. So that would have been what three in the morning for you. Who knows what time at that point, but the Patriots are just garbage, but Forbes put up his best game of the year. He got a 91 grade. The team was hyping it up and he didn't get a chance to try and deliver back to back good games. And mm -hmm. Danny Johnson came in, he did admirably for, you know, being put on short notice and, I'm not saying that we lost the game because of Danny. We lost the game because of Manuel, but you definitely have to change your game plan up. You got guys coming in that weren't part of the defensive game plan at that point. And it, I don't want to say showed a ton, but the Seattle receivers, they, they ate us up. I mean, DK, it was seven for 98 Lockett eight for 92 Jackson Smith and Jigba. He had four for 53. You know, you had uh, 369 yards in the air overall for them. And it was just kind of frustrating to see because we, I feel like, played with our food to a little bit. Like, we were stopping them on third down, but we kept letting them get so far down the field that they could just make field goals. And that just kept them in the game. I mean, they had, what, five field goals from their kicker? I mean, it was just, a, yeah, five yeah. for five. I mean, Myers was five for five in that game. It was just frustrating to see because let, let's just – let's not let them move so far down because all they got to do is get in field goal range. And then speaking of which, the end of the game, I mean, Benjamin St. Juice, I don't know what he's thinking or what was going on, but he got torched. And that last drive was definitely on him and the one prior to that where Lockett tied the game up. I mean, I, I do think it was a BS fourth and five pass interference penalty. Some people are saying, no, BSJ got there early. I'm saying, no, he got there at the same time. And this is actually what Rivera had to say about that call. For Benjamin St. Juice in, in particular, I know he had um, two penalties on that. I think it was the second to last drive there. Um, do, do you say anything to him after that? Is that it? Or are you just kind of let him work through that? Well, you let him work through it for the most part. You just tell him just continue to compete. I mean, it's tough because for as much, you know, for, for the penalty they called on him, you know, to, to, to sit there and, and look at as much contact as, as being allowed, you know, you, you, you almost wonder, you know, why would that be called at that time? I mean, compared to some of them that weren't, I've got about three or four that I'm going to send in and ask if I can get explanations on these as to why they weren't called or why they were called, um, just so I can see if you know where the consistency is. And and right now, there's not a lot of consistency in in, in the con in, in the calls that are being made, or not made for that matter. What could he have done? That aside, they called the penalty. So what could he have done better? to lessen the chance of a penalty being called in that situation? Well, I think for the most part is just the fact that there was contact. Um, the, the thing I struggle with is if you look at it, you'll see that the receiver puts his hand on him just as much. You know, and, and again, it's, it's as you sit there and you talk about, is he getting an edge? At what point are, are, are the, um, is, is the contact leading to an individual having an advantage over the other? That was one of the criteria that, when I was on the um, on the coaches committee that we talked about that needs to be one of the one of the criteria so whether you have a penalty or not for as much contacts being allowed and hand fighting that's being allowed if a guy's getting a true advantage well that ball was thrown high and away and I'm not sure if anybody had an advantage right there when that ball was thrown could you see that penalty when it happened the fourth and five that they called that pi it didn't look like it to me being from my vantage point and i was and so i i was cheering i was like yeah no there's a penalty what the hell i mean it 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 didn't look like it so uh but once again you know being 45 yards away or whatever have you 50 yards away seeing it live it didn't look like it but that ref is standing right there so i i have to to uh give it to him or her what they call I didn't like it. I still don't like it. But but the game shouldn't come down to one play. It, it, it really shouldn't. And so we had opportunities that we squandered. Like we would hurry up and went three and out. That that killed us too. I mean, there, there's so many things that, that we could look at that we could do better. And I, I hate for the ref to call a game, but, but um, that – Mm, it's not good, bro. We, no, we, we it's gotta, not. And we gotta, you're we right. Gotta, we got to do better on on so many other levels. I I, I really do. Um, 
and, and so what do we say about the offense? I, and, I, and I'm going to say it again this week. We've got pieces to this daggone puzzle, and we changed the pieces of the puzzle on offense, and look what we're getting. Jack may have to change the pieces of the puzzle for a week on defense to maybe wake the guys up. You hate to do that to your to your, some people who are getting paid a lot of money, but you may have to do that, man. What pieces are you thinking? I mean, you're talking secondary, you're talking linebacker. Like, what are you thinking? I'm saying whoever needs to be, whoever isn't putting down, okay, whoever isn't on film doing what they feel they should be, needs to be done, then switch them out. I'm not going to call a person out, but I'll just say that the film don't lie. So because of that, you sat Gates down. So put somebody else in who, who wants to play. Or who's gonna do what you ask them to do, or make or make a play? Not who wants to play, but who makes who who make a play, and we just aren't getting that done for some reason. So it, you know, we we put change the pieces of the puzzle until you get it right. That's all I'm saying. I I hear you. I agree with you. I also am gonna rebut and say the problem is the makeup of this roster. Linebacker depth has been an issue with this team since Rivera took over. So you've got Cody Barton, who's hurt, and then you've got Jamin Davis. We only really run two linebackers. Well, okay, if Cody's hurt, then on your depth chart, because of how they've constructed it, you've got David Mayo coming in. There's not much else you can do. Kalik Hudson is not a Mike linebacker. He can only play outside. So then do you move Jamin back to middle? And then after Mayo, you've got DeJon Harris or Jabril Cox. So and I'm, I'm not disagreeing, let's put someone else in, because unfortunately, the part that really sucks with losing this game, we have a 6% chance of making the playoffs. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because there are fans that are listening to this right now thinking we still have a shot to make the playoffs. But at a certain point, it's about evaluation of what you have on, on this roster. So the new GM that takes over can see where you're deficient and where you need some help. And you got to fill those gaps, or maybe this guy, given the right time, can actually step up. You know, Andre Jones Jr. getting in and coming in and making an impact in the game now that Chase and Montez are gone. You know, what's going to happen there? Because you have a bunch of free agents at defensive end. So I'm I'm right there with you. I just feel that also when the secondary, okay, Forbes goes out, you've got Danny Johnson, you've got Christian Holmes. We saw what he did last year, and you've got Tariq Castro Fields. It's just the roster makeup of this team isn't great, but yet you sat gates because you had a center in Tyler Larson who was seven, two and one now seven and three when he started. So, you know, you had a good backup. I don't think that they have good backups in the defensive spots where we would love to see new guys come in. Realistically. I hear you. I, I, I think what I'm saying is, for the guys that aren't producing, that are your starters, that first series, let the backups come in and make those guys want to get hungry. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I you got to do something with these guys. And I also agree with what you said earlier. I think Del Rio has lost this defense. And I feel that guys are playing selfish. You have 52 seconds left in the game. All Seattle needs to do is drive down and get a field goal to win. And actually, before I get to that, a bunch of reporters were asking Rivera if he should have gone for two. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what going for two gets you in the end. I mean, to me, you tie the game up and you hold them off and you play for OT. Or if you go for two there with 52 seconds left, you miss it. Game over. Game Why? over. Yeah, why go for two at that point? Because even if you make two, they can still drive down the field with 52 seconds and get the field goal that they got anyway. And this mm -hmm. was actually what Ron had to say about going for two. Did you consider going for two at the end? Um, you know, in talking and, and, and trying to get a uh, feel for it, the, the, the biggest thing that you get concerned with is how much time was left. 
because again, when they don't have consequences, now the opportunity to move the ball down comes into play. You know what I'm saying? Because they had two timeouts left. Um, so again, it was one of those things that I liked our chances going into overtime. I, I liked the way that we moved the ball. You know, we found a couple of things that we felt we could exploit, and we did. You know, we did it twice um, the, the last couple of drives. So it just felt good going into overtime. I mean, it, it's a moot point because we didn't go for two, and they drove down the field anyway and got the field goal. But I, I agree. I think a bunch of the analytics said go for two there, but I agree with Ron and his assessment of not doing it at that point because our offense was moving the ball. I mean, that touchdown that Sam had to Diami, when you get a chance to look at that thing, dude, he just – he had a perfect pocket, had a bunch of time, and then just dropped it in right over two receivers. I mean, it was just a perfect touch on that ball right there. And I believe that if given the opportunity, we went to overtime – the defense would have got stingy again and held them potentially to a field goal and not a, a touchdown. And then we have a chance to go down the field or maybe we drive and score first with a touchdown and game over. Who cares? Who knows? But it was just frustrating to see the defense play so soft when they needed to play up front and physical. And it's like they were too scared to get burned over top. I mean, St. Juice just got picked on that last drive. And he is supposed to be our best corner. And everyone said, don't let Emmanuel Forbes get put on DK. Well, we didn't have to worry about that. And you want your best corner, which is BSJ to be on him. He got targeted six times when four, when uh, BSJ was on him and he had four catches. And yeah, two of those were the end of the game. I, I, I was going to say that I would have thought that we would have been playing a lot tighter, but when you're looking on the field and then you glance up at the big screen and you see the the the, the defensive backs pretty much six, seven yards away from the receiver, it's like, well, damn, all they got to do is do a slant. And, and, and pretty much that's what they did. Yeah, multiple they, times on yeah. that last drive. Yeah, you're like, wait a minute, what are you, what are you doing here? So – you 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 wonder about the play calling. You wonder about the the, the position that, that you're putting your players in to succeed. And I don't feel that they put the players in a position to succeed. You know, the whole thing about that tight man is that allows your defensive uh, lineman to be able to put some pressure on the guy. So he doesn't have that clear open window because there was there was no pressure. None. He could. Gino could sit yeah. back and and throw a slant, but gee, at least bump him something. Don't give him a free release. So, I, like you said, it, it felt like we didn't play to win or play to stop them. We played to slow them down, and you'll never win that way. At some point in time, you got to do something different. You do. You really do. And this is actually what Ron had to say when he was questioned about the defense giving up 500 yards. And then with yesterday's performance and looking back um, at the defense, especially, did you feel that was more execution? Were there different calls or things that should have been done? And what, what was your instinct there? Well, the biggest thing more than anything else, and, and I kind of felt it yesterday and, and kind of got a chance to look at it and, and look at some of the numbers. And, you know, we got to be better on, on first and second down situations. Um, we put ourselves in a couple of really good third down situations and we were able to convert and we held them four for 14. Um, but yeah, there were, there were some first and second down things that we got to get better at. And, you know, it's collectively, we have to be better overall. You know, we're playing a, a, a number of different guys now, um, you know, especially after last week. And there's, there's some cohesion that has to come, you know, guys got to come together and work together and, so it's it's a little bit of that more than is anything else, but again, it's it's collective. We all have to be better. Ron's obviously not telling us much there, but the defense is just they're giving up way too many yards, way mm -hmm. too many points. I mean, earlier on, I think you had said you wanted us to score twenty seven points a game, and we'd be fine. And well, you're getting your wish, man. I just need to wish next time that I want the defense to stop people from scoring twenty seven points a game. Because it's just – it's frustrating to see because we're wasting just this offensive performance that we're not used to seeing here after being stuck with Captain Checkdown, with Alex Smith, 
for a couple of years and just bad quarterback play. We're finally getting decent to good quarterback play and our defense is just atrocious. And I don't see a way to fix it at all. And yeah, we've got Danny DeVito coming to town with the giants this week, but other than that, we realistically have to, we've got what seven games left. You got to go five and two in the last seven games. If you want to think about actually being in playoff contention and you lose to an NFC team with the Seahawks that you're fighting for that wild card spot for. I don't know if it's going to happen this year, man. I don't think it is. Well, that's what miracles are all about, brother. <laughs> I mean, so, somebody's going to wake up and and maybe at this, at this juncture, it, the light bulb may come on for the defense and say, you know, we're still in it and we need to make a run. You know, it, 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 as Doc Walker always said, it becomes a manhood issue. And I don't want anybody to to take my manhood. I really don't. So I'm going to do everything in my power. And I think that these guys need to do the exact same thing. I don't think that they're, I think that they're, 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 tr- they're trying, but it, it's almost like that it seems as though the effort isn't where it was last year and i know things are different and you can't compare last year to this year but that's all you have to go off of i mean i don't i don't think it's a bad comparison you've got pretty much the same team that was there granted we traded away chase and tez now so you take them out the equation but before when they were here the only difference really was emmanuel forbes you know okay you lost uh cole holcomb and you got Cody Barton in there. Don't tell me Cole Holcomb made us a top five defense. I, I, I'm not going to buy that at all. So from a secondary perspective, okay, you lost Defoe because he got hurt. But mm-hmm. even when he was in there, he was there for the Bears game. We got our ass kicked. You know, just this defense is not where it needs to be or where anybody thought it would be this time of year and we're just giving up way too many yards and i want to say there was a stupid stat that i heard on the radio i think eight out of the 10 games that we played we've given up over 300 yards of offense and the only two that that did not happen was i want to say the patriots game and another game with a quarterback that came in the week of i want to say the cardinals game that was it i mean it's just kind of ridiculous what we've been giving up just from a defensive perspective yards wise bro somebody's got to put some fire under their butts as my coach used to tell me <laughs> do you think firing anybody's going to help just not a fire oh, firing? firing yeah i said i said i said put some fire on this on somebody's oh, butt um do i feel that firing is going to help i think that and I, and as i said i never want to see anybody get fired i I feel as though whatever is going it take is whatever it's going to take to get the 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 message across, and sometimes that's what it takes. I I look at, I mean, granted, they're an S show as well, but the Raiders, you know, they fired their head coach and their interim head coach. They've won two games, albeit yeah. to bad Antonio. teams to to bad teams, but they still won two games. So I think that it could, if it's a positive change, I say yes. If it's going to take away, then of course I say no. But I, but I honestly feel as though at this juncture, doing something differently would spark the guys. I mean, it's week 11, and we're recording this. It's Tuesday the 14th at 4 o'clock. I mean, you've already had your first head coach fired with the Raiders, so Antonio Pierce has taken over. The Bills just fired their offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey. So it's that time of year now where coaches that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, coordinators, they're getting let go. Obviously, this Washington defense is not doing what we thought it was supposed to do or anyone thought it was going to do this year. So does getting rid of JDR really help? I don't know how it can hurt at this point, other than the fact that I think the only person that would call plays would be Rivera. And he hasn't Mm -hmm. called plays 
from a defensive perspective in a very long time, but you didn't get a chance to watch the TV. All they kept showing was Pete Carroll running up and down the sidelines, just going crazy and just waving his arms back and forth like he's one of those things outside of a used car lot. And then you just see Rivera there with his arms crossed, doing the classic Rivera pose. Nothing. Well, maybe, maybe firing JDR will give Ron something to do instead of crossing his arms and get some guys to say, oh, hey. But if anything, I almost think this fan base wants heads to roll regardless because they oh, want yeah. some accountability for how bad it's getting. And even if it's not going to improve anything. So if by chance JDR got fired um, and not Ron, who would it be like Kerrigan or somebody, a position coach to, to come in and be the, the, uh, the head call, head play call for defense besides only, Ron. An offensive coach is the only one that's actually called defensive plays before. So they're not going to take him from being that offensive coach and all of a sudden make him the DC. Then, okay, from a defense perspective, you've got Scanina, who's head of the defensive line. He's never called plays before. So you've got you no know, Kerrigan. I'm sorry, they're not going to put him up there and make him all of a sudden a defense coordinator. You've yeah. got Steve Russ. You don't have anybody realistically that can call plays. You had a guy last year, that defensive backs coach, that we let go and we let walk. But other than that, there really isn't anybody. So I think it would defer back to Rivera. And I think, I can't remember what coach it was. There was an offensive coach that recently let go of somebody, one of his coordinators. And I think now that they're going to actually start calling plays. So it's not unheard of for the head coach to take over coordinator duties if that's what they're supposed to be good at. And Rivera is a defensive-minded coach, so he could technically do it, but is it really going to bring any positive change? I don't think so. I think at this point, like you said, Ted, it would be a fan favorite to release someone. But now that you mentioned it that way, see, I didn't know. But once you break it down that way, I think the fans need to slow it down a little bit and realize that, okay, you just jumped from the firing pan into the fire. And, but I'm sure they'll say, well, how can it get any worse? Well, it could. And other than tanking these last, uh, what, six games, seven games, that's what you'd be doing at this point. When you, when you, when you, when you put it the way that you just put it, and I never looked at it that way. You aren't going to put Kerrigan. You aren't going to put anybody else. In, you and you definitely aren't going to ask Ron to call plays. It ain't going to happen. So we're going to ride this ride, and that's probably why ownership hasn't made a move as of yet because they see the same thing that you just said, and they get paid millions of bucks. They understand that there's an issue, but they're going to ride it out. That's the. Yeah. That's the, I, I see them riding it out once you put it the way that you put it. And I was right. It was Juan Castillo was the former defensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles one season. It went horribly wrong that season. It was the 2011-2012 season. He was the Eagles defensive coordinator. So it did not go well for him. He got let go after that. And he's our run game coordinator now. So can EB coordinate the run game? I don't know. Considering what our run game looks like right now, maybe Castillo's not doing his job there either. Maybe move him to the defensive side. But realistically, just from that perspective, I don't think it's going to happen, even though I'm all for just getting rid of the dead weight now anyway. You know, it was uh, Mitch Tischler on the Beltway Football Pod saying, actually, the best thing on Sunday that could have happened happened. And his reasoning was Sam Howell did well. He put another notch on his belt to the new GM that takes over that he is QB one and the QB of the future here, the commander's lost. So it doesn't hurt your draft status and Rivera didn't win. So you don't have to worry about potentially having the argument. Is he going to stick around? So if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, Sunday went well from my perspective, I never want to lose because of draft yeah. status yeah. or anything like that. Tanking to me is loser talk. You know, we pay good money to watch this team. 
And yes, I don't pick us to win every week just because I don't think we're going to win every week. But do I want them to? Hell yeah. Just same way you do and a majority of our listeners do. It still sucks, though, knowing what's going to happen. And I just want to see Rivera gone because I want to know, can EB do it? Can just like Sam is giving tape to the new GM, I need B enemy to provide tape to the new GM that he can be the head man in charge. So 6% chance of making the playoffs. I don't know if they're waiting until after the Cowboys game. That's what a lot of people are hypothesizing that maybe after Dallas, because we have that mini bye week, then Rivera will be gone and things will change. Or maybe he just lasts the entire season and we're stuck in this, you know, wait and see mode until Black Monday. I I, I see Black Monday. I really do. Unless unless they know something that we don't know. Which is all it's possible. I mean, we don't know everything, but we can speculate. And when you put it the way that you put it, when it comes down to brass tax, who are you gonna trust to call the plays? And I don't think it's gonna happen. Yeah, and I think it was JP Finley talking on his show today. Josh Harris has not fired a coach for I want to say his basketball franchise prior to his contract, prior, at least prior to the season being over. So if that's anything to hang your hat on, it's just I hope that when it's all said and done, that the enemy does get a fair shot to potentially stay here as head coach because of how good he is with Sam. And because it means that Sam will most likely be our QB next year and we don't have to draft another quarterback. Because the part that kills me is seeing Sam have all these stats that are so great to see that we haven't seen since Kirk Cousins. None of it means a damn thing until we know what the new GM wants to do. Because if that new guy says, you know what, Sam's leading the league and passing this and that, but he's not doing these five other things I want, then it's all for nothing at this point. We got to start from scratch. At least I feel that if EB gets that head coaching job, then we're not starting from square one, hundred percent. We're starting from, you know, square five out of 10, if you will, because we know what a quarterback can do. Yeah. And what you don't want to happen is you don't want to have that whole learning curve all over again for a quarterback. I mean, th this would be his third system. If he, if they kept them, they kept them with a the new GM, or even if you brought a rookie in, a, 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 a rookie in, he's got to learn what that quarterback coach wants him to do as well. It, you know, we knew that this would be some shape form of a rebuilding year and we're getting it. I mean, we, we, we really are seeing it. It's, it's, it's developing right in front of our eyes. I mean, it really is, but we know we aren't patient. We just aren't. <laughs> we, we, we want it to work right now. And so I'm, I'm afraid that if, if uh, things change, we might be back into the same scenario for us trying things to. Things are going to change. I mean, I don't oh, yeah. see what, what, I mean, what, what I mean, what, changes. What I, what I mean by that is you bring in a hypothetically a, a rookie quarterback, you get rid of Sam. That means that now whoever you bring in has got to learn that guy's system and potentially be right back where we are is what I'm saying versus yeah. it took, it took Sam how many weeks to, to really finally get this. That's all I'm saying. You bring a rookie in, it's going to take him that many weeks to finally get to where Sam was. And we will, we're, we're repeating the same thing all over again. And basically is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, if anything, Sam's still under contract, they're not going to get rid of him, get rid of him. They're not going to cut him. Maybe they could trade him for another asset come draft time. If whoever takes over doesn't want him here and we get something for him because it comes down to if we take a, you know, are you going to take a quarterback with your first pick? And that's, that's the part that just really pains me because mm -hmm. yes, it's definitely a rebuilding year. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know that Sam can make all the throws. We have seen him do it repeatedly. He is learning. He's feeling that pressure. I went over the offensive blocking numbers. He did not have good blocking this week. He made a lot of those throws just scrambling, running for his life, and still didn't throw an interception. He only gave up three sacks. And I don't want to say, I want to say maybe one of those was on him after watching it, but it was just, it's just going to hurt me more if they move on from him 
because we just we have to start all over again. Yeah. And that's a story for, you know, another pod in the offseason. But I feel if Rivera does get canned, then maybe there's a better likelihood that EB does take over and Sam does stick around. And we have 90 million in cap space. We can get a guard. We can get a center. We can get some guys that can block. And we get a real linebacker that can actually do. I mean, how old is Bobby Wagner? That guy has been in the league for how long? And I feel that he was all over the damn field on us. I mean, how can you tell me that we can't find someone like him to actually come in and do something from a linebacker perspective? It's just, it's just, I'm banging my head against the wall when it comes to this defense, man. <laughs> well, one of the things that I'm hoping if a new GM comes in or a new coach comes in, that you draft a guy for the position that you want him to play and not another position. I mean, I get yeah. it. You want versatility, but at the same time, if you got, if you bring a guy in for a guard, let the guy be good at playing guard. My gosh. And not this position over flex to... stuff is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it'd be nice if we could actually get a guy that's really, really good at one thing and maybe okay at the other. Mm hmm. You know, it's, yeah. oh, well, he can play center, guard, and tackle if need be. Well, I'm looking at the numbers. No, he can't. You know, you move <laughs> Cosme in to guard. Sorry, Cosme hasn't had the best year at guard. So now what's your excuse? You know, mm -hmm. just looking at Cosme's numbers this entire year from a blocking perspective, and he was a high pick. I mean, his run blocking – He's averaging a 69. He had a 47 one week against Atlanta. Against Atlanta? I mean, it's just, I don't know, man. You had a good offensive line here. You got rid of all of it. You know, Trent's in San Fran partying up with Chase. You know, Sheriff is having a good old time in what, Jacksonville now. You got, was it, uh, who's the other guy? Morgan Moses up in Baltimore. It's just, they dismantled the entire thing. And you've got all these journeymen, and then you really need to retool that thing. But wrapping this up, it is Tuesday. They've already had their day off. But if it was you, who doesn't get a day off? Who has to sit there? Who has to pull a Coach Gibbs and sleep there and hear the track truck come in, Ashburn, and pick everything up so they stay and watch extra film? I'm going to say Percy Butler. Yeah. Percy had a bad game. He, yeah. he definitely, definitely did not do too well this week. It was it's frustrating because the young kids got got some hope, but he just he missed a couple of tackles. Yeah. And it's just really big one on that 64 yard touchdown. Huge. I mean, he whiffed just complete <laughs> like grabbing air. Yeah. So I mean, for me, it's two people. One. BSJ, you know, we already harped about it. I mean, I, I do think that fourth and five PI call was a bunch of crap, but he got targeted against Metcalf and he gave up four catches out of six in just key moments of that game. You cannot give that inside contain. You have to use your leverage there. You're giving up slants all day long and they just nickel and dime their way down that field in a couple of plays and got enough for that field goal. And it was just so frustrating. And you, at least I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I did not feel that the defense was going to stop him. 52 seconds left. That's yeah. sad. That Because we weren't getting a pass rush. So you have to rely on a secondary. And I talked to my don't sleep energy players had to be. And it had to be Duran. And it had to be John. I needed those two to get pressure up front. And they didn't get the pressure that I was hoping for. So next thing you know. Are secondary not doing what they need to do? Just they're getting eaten up. So for me, it's BSJ and second person. I'm tired of these Cheeseman snaps, man. By my count, going back and looking at it, from a high snap perspective, he had four high snaps. And I've tried to go back and see if that's why we missed the extra point on the first touchdown on B Rob's touchdown. I couldn't uh -huh. really tell from the TV feed and the all 22 is not out yet, but it's coming up on week 11 and you got Tress way jumping up as high as he possibly can trying to wrangle in some of those punts. I saw that. I saw that from a high snap perspective. I just, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's because Rivera drafted the kid and they actually moved up to get a long snapper and he's just kind of embarrassed at this point. And what else can you do? But someone was talking about it. He is actually the lowest graded special teams player in the NFL. Wow. So, and he's not what cost us the game. No. But you you don't let it come to that. And I feel that he needs to definitely watch some extra snapping film or however the hell he practices or does what he does. But it's driving me crazy. But let's end this thing on a good note, man. Who gets your rally chain this week? Is it your new BFF Pringle or, you know, who gets that rally chain? <laughs> hey, man, I, I got to give it to the guy who's keeping this in the game. Sam. Sam gets it. I mean, I know that's the easy one to do, but uh, without Sam and, and the uh, the way he's throwing that ball around, he's slinging it, uh, we wouldn't be in the position where we are. So I, I got to give it to Sam. Who, who do you give it to? I hear you there with Sam, man. Uh, it's just talking about exciting. It is exciting to finally see a real quarterback. But I got to give it to B-Rob. I mean, on the ground, he didn't really do much. He averaged 4.8 and we went away from the run, but I thought he was going to take it to the house twice. I mean, six catches for 119 yards, that first touchdown that he had down there. I mean, it's just, he's not the receiving running back Antonio Gibson is. And for B to do that, I think I saw some place where I wrote down, he was the first running back to get over a hundred yards since Chris Thompson did for us back in the day when we played the 49ers. And we all know how good Chris Thompson was coming out the backfield. And yeah. to see B-Rob do that, it's it's great to see, man. And it reminded me we had a, a friend come to visit this week for Veterans Day. And I'm taking okay. him around town. And we were on 8th Street. And I drove past a spot where B got carjacked and got shot. And now to see what the kid's doing on the field, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. And hat tip to that kid, man, for – you know, coming back from that adversity and being, I, I want to say at this point, 100%. And if we could ever get the running game going to have him be a true, true dual threat, it'd be great. It'd be great to actually see. And maybe we got a chance to see that this week because we got a horrible Giants team coming into town. But you know how we play those Giants, so who knows? Well, as long as the refs are on our side for a change, I think we, we should be okay. Oh, we're but screwed. you, you you just yeah, <laughs> but you just never know how our guys will be up for the Giants or be down for the Giants. Uh, no gold jackets again, brothers. No gold jackets. So, but Danny uh, DeVito gets a gold jacket this week. I hope God not, man. dang it, I, that wouldn't be good at all. That wouldn't be good at all. But I do hear the music playing in the background, which lets me know that. We're bringing to a close another episode of the DMV Mess Hall. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for reaching out in Seattle that say that you listen. We greatly appreciate it. It does go a long way. You'd be surprised how long of a way it goes. And with that being said, Ted, you got another week to rep it hard or don't rep it at all. Rally Captain, tailgate Ted. Deuces. <laughs>